Okay, back to the presentation. Well, the cows here uh, is a sort of a design pattern called copy and bribe. Uh, I don't know, anyone familiar with that pattern? Great. Well, for me, it came across uh, in the beginning of the 90s, working with a sort of first generation of commercial commodity multiprocessor. And you, like multiprocessor, you need to keep your caches in, in a consistent way. So depending on what you run on the different CPUs, can get the same view of the data. Uh, and this presentation, I think, is maybe different from the others. I'm a developer. I'm not a network engineer, not a Varnish expert uh, in any way. So I'm from a sort of developing perspective using Varnish as a technology. I don't know how many are developers in here. Wow, well, we're not in so big minority. Um, just quick about myself. I work for a small independent consultancy engineering company. We do very much development. Uh, today it's very much about microservices and new types of new SQL uh, data storage technologies. Currently I work for Postnode Logistics. If you haven't got your parse parcels, don't blame me. It's always the driver's fault. So. <laughs> and logistic is just the logistic part. Everything that has to do with uh, the postal part of the business is a different division. Uh, Postnode is in all the Nordic countries except Iceland, I think. Uh, but in, and in Sweden and in Denmark, the Postnode is also responsible for the postal part. Uh, of the business, a very declining business. Uh, you're losing a lot of money there. So, in the group I work for in Postnode, we are a very new group. We work predominantly with services that provide uh, new type of services for customers. And customers in our uh, context is both customers who are sending parcels, like Salando. Dustin and that kind of e-commerce companies, they are the paying customers. The other customers are the recipients, you and me receiving our parcels. We regard they also as customers, but have a different aspect and a different need for services. Just to give you a little bit about the background in Postnode, how it sort of looks from an IT perspective, very, very simple. Typically, Postnode is an uh, old country. Uh, one of the that's one of the sort of key thing to make. That's probably one of the Nordic most oldest companies doing postal service for I don't know four three hundred years or something like that. So old can be good, but you know how old companies are sometimes. The focus is very much from an IT perspective on the production system. Production systems are sorting parcels, managing conveyor belts, uh, knowing where trucks should go, etc. That is what the core business has been about all the time. And in that type of environment, it's very predictive, the load of the systems. It's more or less a function of the number of parcels that is managed every day. Uh, it's a very sort of the culture in that part of the IT is sort of traditionally enterprise software. And you know when it says enterprise software, don't, I'm sorry to say it, you also call Varnish enterprise software. But one, typically, enterprise software is complicated and expensive. Uh, but there are exceptions, of course. <coughs> uh, so the technology used in, in the traditional part is the Oracle, <coughs> TIPCO, Java Enterprise Edition, frameworks, etc., with a very low change rate. So this is very much managed infrastructure by some sort of provider for Postman. When we started, we started mainly, as I said, <coughs> focusing on new services that are um, facing the internet with APIs, with apps, etc., to bring new types of services for paying customers and the recipients. So that's a new track and trace, 
services so you can manage how you want to have your delivery home, what time, not when Postman thinks it's time for you to be home. So new type of services to be, enable them for, for the customer community. We design very much a microservice style of uh, uh, services, trying to make them as small as we can understand them. If you're not smart, you have to make things small. We also have a very sort of polyglot strategy around how we store data. We use a huge amount of Elasticsearch, Redis, graph databases, etc. Um, and we try to be very quick in our delivery process of new functionality. And the strategy is to push all this production information we have inside Postnode out in the cloud and start to make use all that data in a new way so we can bring you all you recipients new services do anyone use the new postnode recipient app for the mobile yeah great do you like it yeah it's good for example you get your parcel ids automatically up in the app we built that so good that you liked it if you don't get your parcels though that's the driver's problem so not to blame what us. Does it provide, what does it provide this application? <coughs> what does it provide? It provides sort of an automatic way you sign up with a mobile number or your email address. And if that information is on the package, parcel information, you will get the package up in the app automatically without knowing the ID of that okay. parcel. But you will have more in the app in the future, hopefully. One of the things we're going to talk about is something you will have in the app, hopefully in the future, and um, is the use case I will talk about today. Um, business came up with a, a, a totally crazy idea that people should be able to select where the parcels are delivered. It doesn't sound really, from a business point of view, crazy. I should be have the possibility to decide where my parcels should be delivered. And in this context, we talk about something called service points. You have probably all been to service point. Service point is this picture there. Some nice person is giving you a parcel if you show your ID. And that service point is typically located in a supermarket or a tobacco store or something like that. You have all been there? If you live yeah. in Sweden. So 25% um, of the volume, so parcels, go to a service point. So that is roughly, per day we manage in about <coughs> 700,000 to a million parcels a day, with an increase of 10 to 15% a year, thanks to e-commerce. So the current solution is that the service point your parcels will be delivered to is calculated from your home address. So I live here at certain amount, so I get my parcels close to Söderhalla. But I work in Solna, and it would be more efficient for me to pick up the parcels when I'm at work. I can't do that today. So that was the whole thing. I, the whole so, the sort of um, uh, service to provide, that you, with your mobile identity, uh, email or mobile phone number to say for this mobile phone or email I want to have my parcels to this specific location the favorite service point so the solution we came up with as I said before the old systems we have in the production environment they are legacy no one wants to change them very much we cannot deploy stuff in there um, the way we probably would have liked to do. So we decided to, if we could very early on in the process, before we more or less receive the parcels from the sending customer, could change the information in the, in the files we get from the sending customer called the EDI files. They look like something on the right there. I will not try to explain the format. I don't know it. But it's really old with some sort of fixed-length separating technology. 
But what we have in this information from a sending customer, like Salando, for example, is we have the recipient's address. We also have some sort of contact information about the recipient that the recipient has given the sending customer, my email address or my phone number that could be used for notification of when my package, uh, my parcels are delivered. So we said if we could, in that early stage, during when we are validating the EDIs, we could go in here and check if, for that specific contact information, there exists a favorite service point. Then we should take that service point and change the basic information in that EDI file before we start going into the whole parcel processing of sorting, putting it on trucks, etc. So, uh, we tried to do things fast, so we started directly with developing something, of course. <coughs> so we built a small microservice that have some uh, really simple stuff. You have some basic APIs. You can put in a service point for my email or my mobile number or both. <coughs> Uh, that put would register that service point and we store it in Redis because it's just a key value thing or a key we put it in some data structures in Redis so it's super quick. And you could also delete it of course. You could go uh, call the delete and delete your service point. One thing to remember here is that if you think about it, we have like 250,000 packages or parcels that we manage this way should be managed this way. And let's say that maybe five to 10% of the population are selecting a favorite service point. So let's say 10% is selecting a favorite service point. 90% of those calls will be no, there is no favorite service point. So it's not found. A, a, a important thing to remember here. So let, we have like a low hit rate of the data don't talk about cache hit rate. We have a low hit rate on the data. The thing was that we, when we started to deploy this, uh, we had like, the, the microservice had a response time of two milliseconds roughly, if you measure on the edge of that microservice. But the whole time between the EDI validation system to the microservice took like 100 milliseconds. We have a fiber <coughs> connection between Boston's internal network and, and uh, AWS, but still, I don't know, thousands of routers, uh, before error configured firewalls, etc. Anyway, it took too long time. So, and the whole EDI validation process we're not allowed to take more than 10 to 20 milliseconds. So we couldn't use this sort of setup. What we could have done was to make a replica of the microservice and put it in, in the internal network very close to, to the EDI validation system. But from a political point of view, how we work, that was uh, impossible. We were, we were never going to be allowed to deploy our stuff inside that network. So, it sounds like we needed some sort of caching here. And we use Varnish uh, for all our internet edge services for caching. So, yeah, maybe Varnish is a good solution to put the Varnish cache very close to the EDI validation to limit that network latency. The thing is just putting in a cache there uh, doesn't really help much. If you remember, the, the expected hit rate we have is very low. So even if we have this 10% of the population's favorite service point in that varnish cache, it's go, going through and pick it up. Most of the time we still have a not found, and the cache will not know if it's, it shouldn't be in cache or not. And what sort of TTLs or all that stuff should we configure this with? It doesn't really help. 
So we have added varnish, and to be honest, we didn't start with varnish plus. We started with varnish, and I come back to why varnish, varnish plus is really key to the solution in the end. So what we needed to build was a, a copy on write. Now we have a cache, but the content of that cache must be controlled by the microservice. The microservice is sort of a <laughs> transaction commander of what is going to be in that varnish cache. So a user do a put, he selects a service point, and he gets a response, yeah, we have got your request. And in the back end of that microservice, we do asynchronous call to the varnish cache. But using a sort of a header that says when you for this get request on this URL, you go through the cache and always pick it up, fetch that data from the microservice. And the same for uh, delete. The only thing is different is you do purge against the cache. So what we really wanted with this solution was to get sort of a distributed data store far away from the microservice, very close to the system that was going to use it. And I think that configuration to write that in Varnish, and I have, had never done anything in Varnish before this, was like maximum a page of BCL code, super simple. So really quick to get it up. And now we were in a situation where we had very I don't think it's even four milliseconds. Uh, response time between the EDI validation system and the varnish cache. And if we're going to update the cache, yeah, we can take the penalty of the 90 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, but it doesn't affect the operation or execution of the EDI validation system. So we get a very good dependency. The EDI validation can work as long as, and if the, with just the varnish cache, if the microservice is down or not, it doesn't really matter for the EDI validation system. Or in the other way around. So, uh, for everybody who hasn't fallen asleep and think this was the most boring thing today, uh, yeah, this is good, but anyone who has a, what is not, enough for the solution we talked about so far? Uh, I was thinking about, so you have replaced actually how the logic of getting the data out of the microservice works in Varnish. So I mean, what happens in the normal case now? Have you decided from the VCL that now respond always no? Ah, oh, sorry. You, you mean a normal get this way? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe I wasn't clear about that. Uh, a get coming from this direction will always terminate here. Okay. If the data exists, you will get the data, or if it doesn't exist, you get a 404. Okay. Sort of a replica exactly what's here. So this microservice has taken over the whole sort of transaction management of what's in here. So, so, so what is the thing between, I mean, what do we do between varnish and, and uh, internal API? In 90 milliseconds. What you do because there? Because then it's the it's the call which actually going to feed the varnish, right? Yeah. You, if you, you have this it. header you on your uh, get yeah. request coming this way, you will go through the cache and read it oh, as okay. a normal. Okay. See, we we sort of with this request, just with this header, okay. we warming the cache. Okay. You just tell varnish, please fetch the go through and okay. yeah. So, so what's your time, time to live is like no limit. Like exactly, that's a good thing. Uh, uh, the time to live is the biggest integer or long number I can have on that entity on TTL. I don't know if it's, maybe someone from Varnish can say. I would like to say it's in, indefinitely or something like that. Okay, so I would set it as high as I have retired when it expired. Right? So it becomes someone else's problem. Yeah. How do you populate it from start? I mean, if, if I, for example, add my favorite 
late. Yeah. And then uh, I don't buy stuff for a very long time. Then I wouldn't properly varnish that. Well, it doesn't have to do about if you buy or not. This is something you do in probably in the app. I say you say I have a service point, favorite service point, and that ser favorite service point is not just for that parcel delivery. It's for every delivery. Yeah, I understand. But if I make the settings, yeah, it will populate varnish. Yeah, exactly. But, yes. but um, if varnish gets restarted or something, yeah, you never populate. Exactly. So that's. It comes back to what I what, what I wanted to yeah. find here, <laughs> but you're right, and that's why it says varnish plus. But we didn't start with varnish plus. I was naive. I thought that the old persistent was good enough, but it wasn't, of course. Because it's all about when you're building microservices, you are in the the issue with distributed uh, distributed systems, and distributed systems, everything can go wrong. And you have to manage that. So it's all about the, the data consistency. How can I guarantee that I have the same data representation in my microservice, Redis, and Varnish? The network can be done down when I'm doing that. Like you said, I select my favorite source place. But when I do that, I can't reach Varnish. Network is down. Varnish is down for something else. Maybe maintenance or something like that. I can't. I can't, can't expect anything to work. So you have to take measures. You have to start to think about transaction. And these transactions are not the two-phase transaction that you get when you're buying Oracle or stuff like that. But you have to manage your transactions. So the first thing was that we wanted, we needed Varnish to be persistent between restarts. So we don't need really massive storage, but we need guaranteed storage. Um, our data are small JSON objects. That's the only thing. There is no video feeds or anything like that. Just small things. And it will never be massive, but it has to be persistent. The other thing was that we need to, from the microservice, we need to manage the transaction log. If we are trying to do it, to varnish and we get we can't connect to varnish by some reason we have to save that state save that transaction and retry again that's the only thing you can do if you're not sort of in a um, have your two face commits or whatever and we don't really want to tell the user the client to do that call well sorry varnish is down for the moment do this again later we, we just tell the client we accepted your change and we will guarantee to be eventually consistent between the microservice and your varnish instance. So we have to have the measures of knowing what sort of calls we tried to do to varnish that didn't get through, and we try them by some logic of exponential timeout or whatever we do. But you have to guarantee that they are eventually consistent. Never forget them. And you can also have sort of your acknowledgement or commit on that transaction to check that if I made this change to varnish, is it really in varnish? So I can do uh, simply read it again, just after I've done that first time, and see if it's, it's taken away or not. And we also have some operations that you can say, OK, I don't expect anything in varnish. I just repopulate the whole cache. And of course, depending on the latency we have talked about, it can take a uh, fairly long time, but you will eventually be consistent. Okay. So, <clears throat> with this solution, we got some, what I think, some nice benefits. We get a pretty robust solution. Things are not really depending on each other, as long as this microservice takes the responsibility of being in the transaction commander of, of the solution. We can scale independently of the, the varnish and the, the microservice. Improved speed, like what, what we have very much shown. I also think that one of the good 
thanks to the solutions, you consume the right type of resources. Instead of going from that EDI validation system to the microservice every time, and in 95% get a not found, but spending on CPU resources there, we go to varnish instead that is optimized for this, and we can more or less do as many requests as we want. So we're spending our resources, CPU, memory, etc., in the right place. Uh, all the updates of the Varnish cache is done sort of out of scope of the execution of the EDI validation system. We never affect the EDI validation system of the updates or deletes we're doing in the cache. And I think also one of the important thing here is that this is super effective, especially in the situation when you have the data population that you, uh, um, you're querying on has a low hit rate. Remember, you do 250,000 calls from the EDI validation system, but maybe in 5-10% you will get the response. So, Especially in this situation, this is, uh, and I think, a good solution. And now we can also start to expand on this solution, like using request parameters that are called from, from the client to this microservice. And we can start to populate different caches, on, for example, on dif for different countries. Because, of course, in a company like Postnode, there are different EDI systems in Denmark and in Sweden. But we still want to have one single Nordic solution for favorite service board. That will not be different for us as a recipient. But now we can start to decide, depending on where the service point is located in the world, push it to different caches. So if you're working, you live in Malmö, but work in Copenhagen, you could pick it up in Copenhagen instead. Yeah. Well, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> in theory. In, uh, in theory, yeah. And, and that's the absolutely something on the agenda that you should be able to, but you will have to pay an additional price for it, a cost, as a recipient. But as a recipient, you should absolutely say, I don't want it in Stockholm, I want it in Copenhagen, Oslo, or Umeå, or whatever. But that's probably after the summer. So I think this, uh, I think we will use it pattern more. And the great, great thing is that since all our microservice in their public sort of APIs, it's always REST. And Varnish is something you put in there, intermediate between your your different server. So, yeah. Thank you for listening. And uh, I don't know if you have any questions. Yeah, questions, yes. Did I do it in time? Yeah. 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 Two minutes over. So, any questions by others? Or? Yes, like on the functionality of the app itself. Like, uh, so if I put my favorite pickup spot close to my work, and I have a country house, and I yeah. order something there. Uh, which is a completely different address. It's nothing close to my mm. regular uh, house. Uh, where would I get it? You you will only get it to one place. That's the first thing. <laughs> okay. The, the thing is that um, if you because you're doing matching on the G uh, the email address or the phone number, right? Yeah. It's going to be the same, but shouldn't you include like maybe the address as well somehow? Well, there is some other. Things that, I mean, you should be able to put, say that I want to have, I want to change my service point because I'm going to vacation now. I'm going yeah, to my, yeah. ah, okay. so I, I have to change my, my uh, uh, favorite service point to your, where you have your cottage. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that for, for a, a person that has started in the process to be past the validation and you change it afterwards, you think on that single entity of a yeah. person. That will not yeah. this solution work for them. That that is a different kind of solution we have to implement. Mm. Um, but again, this this could probably be expanded and be made more more functionality oh. in the future. It can be also according to what you want to receive. 
I, I said that you you own specific furniture for your summer house. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, but if you if you, if you probably all uh, uh, ordered your um, furniture to your summer house, probably your address would be your summer house, and then you would get it close. I mean, it's also depending on the sort of logistic products that customers provide, or things that you can pick up at the service point. Furniture should never be at your service oh, point. Yeah. That happens. But yeah, I, I had to, to be pick to be, up yeah. my furniture at the, and they were crazy out there because they had so much furniture. But this is this is parcels up to twenty kilos. Okay. Otherwise, I have another question. How do you actually manage to keep the information in the application? Because then you need some kind of uh, database, right? Yeah. Sorry, I, maybe I wasn't clear. We use Redis. I don't know. I, have Redis, I don't. Yeah, Redis is a. Uh, if you haven't used Redis, use Redis or check it out. It's a super cool, cool uh, key value, but the value can be all the sort of collection type that you ha use when you're developing programs. So it can be sorted sets, sets, lists, and maps, and hyperlog logs and. Uh, it even has machine learning today as modules in Redis. It's a really smart Italian guy who has written Redis. So. Why Redis over some others? Sorry? Why Redis specifically? Uh, because it's... Uh, uh, why we selected Redis and not something else. Yeah. What are the other cycles? I don't know what I can compare Redis. You could. Probably memcache. Yeah, but memcache has just key values. Yeah. If you I want to have a key pointing to a list, or a key pointing to a, a set of data, or a sorted set, I can't do that in memcache. But memcache has absolutely its use I cases too. I agree with you. Redis is probably better. Yeah. The best choice of key values at the moment. Yeah. So if you need to have complicated data structures, or complicated, but data structures, Redis is really cool. And it, it's um, super fast. Okay. No, I, I just asked because we, we had issues with Redis. So. Okay. Yeah, and we should get Cassandra mm -hmm. over oh, okay. Redis. Yeah. Okay. Um, that would be interesting to hear more, more about in the break. Yeah. One last question. How, how do you authenticate? Yeah, the, the way we authenticate today is, um, is that when you register your mobile number, and say, this is the mobile number I want to have uh, a service point for, you get the validation. So validation is sent to your mobile number as an SMS, and you get a PIN, and you have to validate with that. Or th and the same goes for e emails, too. We uh, are looking at other solutions, um, more authentication, because this brings it into a totally different area have a user profile not just your we don't know who you are we just know a mobile number so we don't know anything about you so we're looking at the way to have built a user profile and level up so in the end you can maybe level up with using your mobile bank ID because then you can do money transactions buying stuff from us so. but you still need to be what's called GDPR compliant because um, a phone number yeah. and email address can identify you. Sure, so if you keep but GDPR doesn't say that you're not allowed to use mobile numbers, or uh, but you yeah, but you, you, need you to have to, to be forgotten. So you need to be able to cleanse logs, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole thing with that whole uh, law. Yes. <laughs> that, yeah. I, I think that's out of the discussion here. But maybe if someone wants to discuss GDPR, uh, I'm, I'm uh, interested because uh, it affects very much. As a, as a DevOps guy, don't deploy anything after 2018 because you can be responsible for a fee, uh, fine. I mean, it's personal responsibility after that law. Yeah, that will affect Thanks very much, Founders. Yeah, no yes, problem. Thank you very much. Thank you for